Greetings, Dream Warriors! It's your local raccoon and leather slayer here. There are genres out there that many a rock fan will swear up and down to contain nothing but the stinkiest of garbage, and having the sheer bravery to compliment anything from within said genre's vicinity will result in immediate backlash. I beg to differ, however. Even in genres brimming with utter trite, there's bound to be a diamond or two hidden underneath the turd pile. For today's metal retrospective, we're returning to the leopard print pants bedecked money printing machine that we all know as glam metal. For all the greats this genre spawned in its early years, there's no denying that it degenerated greatly with age, morphing into something that can by no stretch of the imagination be construed as heavy metal. And by 1991, it very much needed to be tearfully put down like a golden retriever with rabies. With a legacy tarnished by turd after turd after ungodly turd, only a few glam metal acts remain critical darlings in the music community at large. Well, as the title suggests, we're not going to be talking about GNR, Def Leppard, or any of those other classic rock radio staples, but an unfairly overlooked bundle of melodic metal majesty known as Dokken. Formed in LA back in the 70s when Van Halen were making their rise, Dokken are one of those bands that deserved far more than what they got. More metal than most of their contemporaries, Dokken only received comparatively minor success at the bottom end of the Billboard Top 100 here and there, and broke up due to infighting for a few years when the genre was at its absolute biggest. This along with some other factors contributed to a hair metal band that didn't become a household name, but for the metal community at large, a hair band that's actually respected. With Don Dokken's soulful vocal prowess and George Lynch's guitar acrobatics, Dokken are one of the few hair metal bands that me and other metalheads can call more than a guilty pleasure. In fact, they're one of my personal favorite bands, period. So, without any further ado, it's time to delve into the iconic album that started it all. Dawkins' inaugural effort is an interesting case indeed, as it was released twice. The 1981 version was released on French label Carrere, and is a fairly raw affair containing some of Hard Rock's 70s remnants. Two years later it would be re-recorded and released by Elektra Records. Sadly, the album would prove unsuccessful and Elektra considered dropping the band due to the fact. With the passing of time, Breaking the Chains has gone on to become a beloved early glam metal classic, with the standout title track being one of the crowning gems of early 80s metal, complemented by an awesomely cheesy music video. As for the rest of the album, it's okay. Yeah, Breaking the Chains has a slight case of first album syndrome, and is probably the weakest of their 80s golden age material. There are some underrated gems on here, such as In the Middle and Paris is Burning, but it's very clear that Dawkins' best was yet to come. Now that's more like it. Dawkins' first truly great record. Dawkins would enlist Tom Worman as producer this time who has hit records under his belt from other glam bands such as Motley Crue, Striper, and Twisted Sister. The recording sessions weren't all grand, as vocalist Don Dokken and lead guitarist George Lynch would begin their now famous infighting. Then again, infighting and division seems to be the norm for almost every rock band in existence. That set aside, Tooth & Nail is a fucking masterpiece brimming with classics such as Just Got Lucky and Into the Fire. Even the album's token ballad, Alone Again, is great. A somber emotional breakup song, and one that hits close to home for me given the multiple breakups both plutonic and romantic that I've been through in my life. But for those fearing Dawkins' just another cheesy hairband, Tooth & Nail balances out the glam stuff with speed metal gems like the title track and turn on the action. Proof positive that Dawkins aren't your ordinary hairband. In short, this album is the first in Dawkins' trilogy of 80s masterpieces, a must-own for fans of classic metal. <laughs> Due to 
Do not let the most 1980s album cover in existence fool you. Under Lock and Key far usurps anything else in the glam metal genre, which by 1985 was slowly but surely beginning its sad descent towards diabetes-inducing bubblegum pop. For the Doc and Faithful, this is commonly seen as the band's apex, with tracks such as the infectious In My Dreams, the pounding Unchain the Night, and The Hunter. Under Lock and Key is easily one of the top five best glam metal albums, period. Sleek 1980s production with an eargasmic guitar tone. Even the ballads are outstanding, and employ a great use of atmosphere, just the way softer moments on a metal album should be. Under Lock and Key, a strong contender for Dokken's best album, period. In that landmark year of 1987, Dokken would release Back for the Attack. Out of their 80s material, this would probably have to be the most blatantly glam album, but do not let that deter you. Even as a pop metal album, Back for the Attack is the best in that category for 1987. The same year as Motley Crue's vacuous ode to mindless fornication, and an album Def Leppard spent roughly the GDP of Bulgaria on to predictable results. While other glam bands were simply making brain-dead songs about sex, Dokken wrote an opening track delving into the consequences of said mindless sex. In other words, STDs. But without question, the real party piece is Dream Warriors. A song I personally interpret as being about nightmares and sleep paralysis demons. That's part of what makes Dokken so great. Not only is the music a big cut above the competition, but the lyrics are Shakespearean by glam metal standards. Unfortunately, with Don and George constantly at each other's throats, Dokken would call it quits for over half a decade, ending out the 80s with a stellar ballad by the name of Walk Away. But with the 90s on the horizon, Dokken's brand of metal was quickly falling out of style. Don Dokken would produce a solo album in 1990 entitled Up From The Ashes, which I will say is a pretty good album in and of itself, but Dokken themselves wouldn't reunite until the midst of the 90s grunge craze, no less, before finally releasing a comeback album in 1995. It's 1995. Even with the biggest name in grunge having sadly taken his own life, he and his ilk had completely changed the face of rock. Glam metal and 80s styled metal in general were long dead and a laughing stock in the rock community. A sentiment that hasn't withstood the test of time in my honest opinion, the death of glam metal circa 1991 in the eyes of some was basically the rock and roll equivalent of the nuking of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Sure, you did take out some evil war criminal scum, but you also unfairly took down countless thousands of innocent men, women, and children who had nothing to do with it. 1995's Dysfunctional is a far cut above the rest of the Glam Goes Grunge albums being released in the mid-90s, mixing elements of their 80s hard rock heavy metal sound with grunge and thrash metal. Honestly, this album isn't too bad. Tracks such as Inside Looking Out, What Price, and Too High to Fly are worth a listen. Sure, this album won't go down well for those glam metal purists who somehow think that grunge was the end of all good music, but if you've got an open mind, Dysfunctional is a good album that is worth checking out at least once. The same cannot be said about the next album, though. Released in the exact same year as Motley Crue's bafflingly awful Generation Swine, Dawkins' Shadow Life might as well be a companion piece to that pseudo-grunge dog shit, complete with an ugly mid-90s album cover that looks like something a 13-year-old made in Photoshop. As someone who likes both grunge and glam metal, I just cannot get into glam bands dipping their middle-aged toes into grunge. It's just so insincere and half-assed almost every single time it happens, and Shadow Life is no exception. It's an album that no rock fan of any breed is going to get any enjoyment out of, especially back in 1997. 
Without question, the worst album Dokken has ever recorded. Do yourself a favor and skip this sorry turd. For their next album, Dokken would give George Lynch the boot and enlist guitarist Reb Beach from glam metal punching bag Winger, a band that might be a tad bit overhated in my opinion. After the previous outing's failed attempt at aping Pearl Jam bombed like Nagasaki, there was nowhere else to go but up, which still means that compared to their 80s output, Erase the Slate is a fairly mediocre affair. But overall, it's superior to that previous album that lives a life in the shadows. Still, I can't truly recommend this album, and it's safe to say it's still one of Dokken's weaker albums. The definition of a 6 out of 10. In between the releases of Erase the Slate and Long Way Home, Dawkin would release a stellar best of compilation, one I happen to hold in my collection and listen to all the time. Long Way Home would come to record store shelves in 2002, complete with a nude chick on the album cover. Dawkin clearly aren't trying to market towards horny teenage boys to coax them into buying a middle-aged hairband's record. In all seriousness though, this album is a bit better than the previous two outings. Though very much a glam grunge hybrid still, it feels like a more genuine combo than either Erase the Slate or the album that lives a life in the shadows. Overall, a decent album with some 2000s magic to it. Older fans probably won't find that much to love, but younger rock fans such as myself are bound to get at least a kick or two out of it. Once again, Dokken had gained a new guitarist by the name of John Levin, who remains the band's guitarist to this very day. Within the first few tracks, you can tell this album is a qualitative rebound, albeit one that can understandably not live up to their 80s perfection. You've got a perfect blend of hard rock and metal such as The Last Goodbye and Don't Bring Me Down, and morose 2000s rock ballads such as Escape and Can You See. If you're someone with a soft spot for the 2000s like me, Hell to Pay is honestly worth listening to. Much like Dysfunctional, Hell to Pay is a perfect mixture of contemporary rock with their signature sound. For fans of 2000s rock, this is the Dokken album to own. With contemporary radio rock fading and the music industry quickly moving towards the cesspool of raw sewage that it is now, Dokken decided to fully embrace their 80s glam metal sound once more. Granted, I liked Dokken's take on 2000's rock on Hell to Pay and even Long Way Home, but it was clear that fans wanted some good old fashioned cock rock metal, and Lightning Strikes Again is great neo glam metal. Even a few diabetes ballads like How I Miss Your Smile can't take away from the greatness of this record. Honestly, if you just close your eyes, you could swear that this album came out of the late 80s, convincing neo glam metal at its finest. Dokken has not released a full-length album in a decade by now. 2012 was 10 years ago? It feels like it was just yesterday my pubescent self was having to sift through an endless procession of Gangnam-style dances and Black Ops 2 videos made by bronies set to dubstep. Broken Bones is more of the same neo-glam metal from Lightning Strikes Back, really. I prefer the previous outing, to be honest, but Broken Bones is still a decent record overall. For those fearing this might be Dawkins' last album, Don Dokken has announced they've already recorded a new album last year. The thing is, this article is from a year ago and still no new album as of this recording. Kinda curious as to why that is. Even if that album never materializes, Dokken will remain one of glam metal's greatest bands. Sure, they may have fallen off during the 90s like most of their contemporaries, but their 80s output is goddamn perfect and far usurps the poisons and Bon Jovi's of the world. 
a band equally valid as a radio-friendly hard rock band as they are a metal band. It's honestly baffling they never had more success during their heyday. For all their metal chops, they knew how to bang out a catchy rock tune just as well, and had the music industry been more fair to them, they could have been at least a bronze to Motley Crue's gold. I guess Doc and were just a bit too artistically viable for hair metal standards. Seriously, if you're the kind of person who thinks that all hair metal is cheesy ballads and sex-hungry anthems, take a listen to Dawkins' 80s material and watch as those shallow observations are quickly put to rest. Dawkins, more than just another hairband, and in my honest opinion, one of the finest pop metal acts of the entire 1980s.